Welcome back to Sweet Script Stories. I am Eric Grubaugh. And I'm Tim Dietrich. And today we have a special guest with us. Matt Dossi is the Senior Solutions Architect at 360 Cloud Solutions. Matt, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Eric. Thank you. So why don't we open up and have you just uh, tell people a little bit about your position now, what you're doing in the NetSuite world, and how you got there. Great. Uh, so, uh, senior solution architect at, at 360 Cloud Solutions. My job is basically um, um, two things. One, sitting in front of customers and helping them understand what NetSuite can do and, and, and giving them a basic idea of you know, the effort involved. And then really writing detailed um, user stories and, and statements of work and things like that to make sure that our developers can um, uh, can keep our promises, um, which is to say, deliver the functionality that, that the customer needs um, for an estimate that we agreed on in advance. So um, it gives me an opportunity to really explore the dark corners of NetSuite because they don't generally call me in on the easy problems. Um, it's it's going to be stuff that no one's ever seen before or um, you know, stuff that's brand new, uh, stuff that's, you know, obscure or just a very challenging business use case that, um, that needs a, a solution around. So it's a, it's a enormously gratifying work for me. And, um, uh, on top of that, I get to work with some great people who are, you know, on the development side and, and on the consulting side and then the customers themselves too. And I end up as a, sort of liaison between all of them because I speak all their languages. So um, it, it it puts me right in the middle of the action. It's interesting. All of the action. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, is that, has there ever been an, a project or an opportunity that's come across where NetSuite just clearly wasn't a good fit? Like the business's requirements are just so bizarre that even NetSuite couldn't meet them? So yes, I would say, I would say that, that happens fairly frequently. And um, by the time that that this situation is is brought to light, or maybe it, either NetSuite's the last choice. In what's in, in one case, I can recall it, it was the, the last choice. Every other ERP had walked away from the table because their their use cases were so bizarre. Um, and so difficult to accommodate. They said, no, you know, SAP can't do that. You guys have fun with it. Um, and Nestle was the only one left at the table. Um, in those situations, we end up with a super highly customized instance of NetSuite. Um, that NetSuite is flexible in that there's nothing that NetSuite, strictly speaking, cannot do for the right price um, in customization and, and integration. Um, so it, it, it can get it done, but it's not suitable. Um, so I guess in one way, the answer to your question is that no, I've never seen something that NetSuite couldn't do with enough customization. Um, but if you were to ask me, is there anything NetSuite shouldn't do? I would change my answer there to yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been there. <laughs> Interesting. So I know we skipped around a little bit, but tell us a little bit about your sort of path to NetSuite. I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and, you know, it looked like you, like a lot of people, you know, you were doing a bunch of different things. And then at some point, NetSuite suddenly shows up. Like, well, how did, how did that happen? How did yeah, you first so, go into it? So completely randomly, I guess I'll, I'll start with my pre pre NetSuite years that looking back on that were prepping me for the, you know, for, um, for the, the job I ended up taking, uh, eventually, but, um, so pre NetSuite, I worked for a manufacturing company, um, for a, a lot of years, like 14 years I was with them and it was really made to order very custom tailor-made, uh, bed sheets, um, for, for odd shaped beds. I'm talking about the kind of bed you'd see on a boat or 
you know, a round bed or something that just hit the market, a heart-shaped bed, um, back when electropedic beds were first, you know, were, were novel before the baby boomers all started buying them. You couldn't buy sheets for them. Uh, water beds were big. Um, anyway, the production was such that they had to create each order with specific measurements and they had to be done in such a way that if you're using this fabric, you have to cut it two inches over because of shrinkage and this fabric it has to be two inches wider. This kind of elastic needs more measurements. They had to have some way of planning out how to design their production. And I was hired as an office manager because literally no one else in the company knew how to use a computer. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> My sole qualification at the time was an A plus computer tech um, certification. This was back at the end of the 90s, so um, 1999. Um, I, I knew some basic programming, some basic development. I'd, I'd, I'd played around in C and in a, you know, um, knew, knew a little bit of, of you know, visual basic and things like that as a hobby. But you know, as this as this role grew and I ended up having to design a you know a production management tool, it it then became it sort of branched out into okay, now we're managing our production within this software tool. Now we need to be able to schedule you know, future production with this software tool and expose that to our customers through our website. When's their order going to ship? Uh, sort of like the Domino's pizza tracker before that was a thing. So introduced me to all kinds of web APIs. And I, I was just learning on my own how to do this. Um, and it got to a point where I, I, I became a bit more comfortable with it. And um, um my brother approached me with another project that I was going to work on on the side, which was a, a, a sort of a, an estimating and, um, and, uh, and work management tool for his business, which was a, a restoration. So when a fire or flood happens, they'll come in and clean it up and, and restore the property. Um, a lot of insurance-based stuff, a lot of, a lot of things around you know, measuring uh, moisture levels, uh, working with insurance companies, um, producing PDFs. So I built a, a web application for him, which he still uses to this day, believe it or not. Um, and, and it was coming from that um, when I, um, at the time, I, I didn't have a degree. I didn't have, I'd never gone to college and um, decided, well, I've already learned also, I've already learned so much. Why don't I go get a degree for this sort of thing and change jobs to ones that I, one that actually, you know, would, would put this stuff to use. That 360 cloud solutions. And I think the call came from Eric Grubal here. <laughs> Small world. Um, yeah. Uh, we were working with a recruiter at the time who I believe you are related to or or no so uh, I forgot about that so thank you oh yeah that's a hilarious story so it turns out my brother who I was doing this work for at the time his wife uh ran a, a recruiter called tech defenders in in um in Arizona it's not tech defenders <laughs> uh no it's not it was uh something else uh, I know why you said that but Tech Finders. Tech Finders. There you go. There's actually a company I'm working with called Tech Defenders. <laughs> uh, tech, tech Finders. Yeah. So I, I think the first, when I, you know, I, I, I went to her and I said, hey, I've, you know, just got my degree. I'm looking for a position in, you know, in software development somewhere. And they're like, oh, great. We need, we need recruits. I'll put your name out there. And, um, and it just so happened that you were working with the same company. And that's, and that's what, uh, that's what kind of got me in the door, I guess. Yeah. So full disclosure, I hired Matt at 360 Cloud Solutions a long, a long time ago. Yeah. And, and my, and my sister-in-law got paid for it. <laughs> I guess. Yep. yep. So Matt, you can blame all of this on Eric, right? <laughs> 
Oh, um, I've, I've got Eric to thank for a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all do. Um, so Eric, a question for you. Do you remember what it was that you saw in Matt when you hired him? That was, was there something where you're like, yeah, this is our guy or do you remember what that was like? Oh, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. I, uh, remember just so I, when I was interviewing people at the time, I did not one, well, yeah, I did not do a lot of code. I didn't make people write a lot of code. I still wouldn't if I was, if I were interviewing today, um, I used more like conceptual problem solving. There was a little bit of code involved in some like sort of JavaScript trivial question, trivia questions, basically, just to make sure what was on your resume was accurate. Um, but beyond that, it was mostly like conceptual problem solving, more um, architecture level questions. Like uh, one of my favorites was sort of just how would you go about designing a poker game or or some sort of simple like a game where somebody under, you know, most people understand most of the rules. Um, anyway, so what I remember is Matt having very clear solutions, <laughs> like being very organized and structured and, uh, just, uh, having, like I said, a very clear idea of the, the high level, uh, of problem solving and that is what I was looking for at the time. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So Matt, that was your first exposure to NetSuite then, right? When well, ab absolutely. I had to look up NetSuite, you know, after I, after I got the phone call and yeah. like, what is NetSuite? No idea what it was. Um, didn't even know what the term ERP was, although it turns out I've kind of been designing one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so I was completely, you know, coming in a babe in the woods to NetSuite and, and that whole ecosphere. Um, First couple of weeks were brutal, you know, because you're you're having to learn two things. You're, you're you're learning the the API, but you have no idea why you're learning the API because you don't understand what NetSuite does, what it is, how it works, um, how to get into it. I think I had to wait like a week before we had a license <laughs> for you to log into it. Um, uh, so yeah, it was, all it was very concept. disorganized at that point. <laughs> But I, I remember being being sort of called into a you know um, little hour long blocks with with Eric where he would go through you know what the script types are what what the NetSuite's database looks like from a high level um, you know what what the big building blocks were invoice so the you know, order to sales or the order to cash uh, chain and and things like that. And and slowly it sort of come to, to come together. Um, I, I I don't know if I was faster or slower than any other app. I, I think I was probably slower because I tend to be one of those people that needs to have, have the whole picture before I can you know, take one step. Um, at least I used to be. Life has taught me different since then. But um, it was it was a it was a long time before I felt like I had any, anything to contribute uh, to the team. So um, I'm not sure how common that is, but it certainly was. was I would say it's it's pretty common, or it was at that time anyway in that place. Yeah. Well, at the time that all that was going on, there really weren't a lot of resources for you, right? I mean. Eric was your resource that, and I guess that's we help, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. And I did have teammates yeah. um, that, you know, that sat shoulder to shoulder with me that, that were supposed to be there to, you know, to do their own jobs. Um, so I was reluctant to really reach out to them for questions, but um, they couldn't really feed me work. Mm -hmm. Like I was often, just set a drift to read documentation or something. And, and because everybody was busy, it was a busy time. And we, you know, we, we were in a hiring frenzy because we had work to do. Um, and, and the company, to be honest, wasn't all that well organized at the time. Um, it's, it's gone through a sea change now. And of course it's much better, but uh, at the time it was, it was pretty chaotic. And we, 
my memory of that time was that I, you know, I was, I was not given a lot of work to do, um, which left me in the awkward place of, okay, what, what do I do to fill my hours? And see, that was really just poking around at the work that other people had already done, looking in, at, a, at a script and trying to figure it out and reverse engineer it and, and read the documentation and, and sort of wait for my next precious hour long talk with, um, with Eric where he could finally <laughs> Answer my question and get me moving again. So it was uh, it was tough. It was tough. And there, there weren't there weren't a lot of resources out there. And now things have, have changed. We've got you know, all this content online put out by yourself and Eric and um, other contributors in the space that you've, you've talked to. Um, I wish I had that coming into it a few years ago, but. Yeah, it's a very different world, I think, from then. And I was fortunate enough when I started with SweetScript to have the resources that Eric had put out, especially his YouTube videos and then his books. And that's a great segue into me discovering you <laughs> um, because I like one of the very first resources that I found was your book, which is the NetSuite development with SweetScript 2.0. And I wanted to ask you about that because I think the one thing that the three of us have in common is that we've written books, not necessarily all on NetSuite. I, I wrote a FileMaker book a few years back of all things, but it was a, that was a really strange experience for me. And I'm just curious about how your, the opportunity to write the book came to you. You know, is it something that you thought of and you pitched it or did they come to you? And then what was the process of writing it? You know, was, was it smooth and like, oh, this is great? Or was it anything but that? So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of questions in here. I, I would I'd start by saying that the, the in, in, impetus for the book wasn't anybody coming to me. It was me needing to get this stuff down mm -hmm. so that I could understand it better. Um, you know, in, in your head, there's this framework of how everything all fits together, right? Um, and, and, and in as long as that stays abstract and up in your head, you're never really going to master it. I, I really wanted to get it down and document it someplace. And as I started doing that, um, it, it occurred to me, wow, this, this could be the, the public, this should be a public document. People should be able to come to this and, and say, okay, this is where I start. Here's the ramp to get me to get me up and in, in, into this subject. Maybe not take me all the way, but get me up to the floor level where I can then build something. Um, and I think at the time I'd, I'd reached out to Eric, who was still engrossed in a lot of other projects, um, and, I, and I asked him to be a collaborator. And he was, I think he was positively receptive at first, and then it it dawned on him, or or it it it. it became clear to him that he would, just wouldn't have the time for it. Um, and my memory could be fuzzy on that, Eric, so you know, check me if I'm mistaken there. But I ended up no, just- that's about just, it. Yeah, I ended up just, just taking it on and and, I'm, and it's completely self-published. It's not like I went to a publisher and, and proposed the book. I just started writing um, through LeanPub, um, which gives you a, a, a real easy path to getting a, getting a book to the, to the marketplace and even, you know, selling a book before it um, before it's completely done, um, which which I'd started to do after I felt like it was about I think twenty five percent there. I I put it up there for like a really cheap price, and of course every time if you bought it, every time that I post an update to it, that becomes you know you own that update too. So there are people out there, readers out there who you know bought the book for like five bucks or something and <laughs> they're getting the whole thing, uh, which now uh, now has a price of like $39 suggested and 30 minimum or something. But um, it's, it, it's a great platform to work from. It works from, uh, it works through Git. So I just commit changes to the book, just like I'm committing software changes and uh, hit a publish button and, and voila, it's right there and it's accessible. Um, it's, it, it kind of started off as like, I just need to get this stuff out of my head. And then it evolved into sort of a relationship between a 
teacher and a student that I hadn't met. Like if I'm talking to my student, what do they need to know? And that's that was a tremendously helpful tool for me to grow as a developer. Because I, I mean, it's been said before, it's not an original thought coming from my mouth, but that you never master a subject until you've had to teach it. And, and I, I didn't have anyone to teach at the time. It was, it was just this, but I wanted to master the subject. So um, one of the ways that I, I kind of forced myself to do that was writing the book. Now, at this point, I had already got all the certifications that NetSuite had to offer for uh, development and consulting just because I needed to have to study for those certifications to gain the level of mastery that I wanted. So when I'm out of certifications and there's no one left to teach, the only path forward for mastery is, is either just, hey, the time and the grind, or you put yourself in a position where you have to have to become the next level of expert, and that's by you know writing a book. So uh, that was the challenge I put out before myself, and that's it's kind of where where it came from and where it where it landed. Now, since then, um, the book has been sadly neglected. <laughs> it's, it's honestly I haven't seen an update since I think early 2018 or something. Um, there's been a lot that's happened in the in the NetSuite space, and particularly with the NetSuite IDE since then. So large portions of the book are are now um, sadly out of date. Um, uh, so that's on me. It needs to be updated. Plan to do it as soon as um, life allows me. But, uh... Yeah, so the version of the book that I have was from November 2018. And I honestly, I think it still holds up pretty well. I mean, I, it's like you mentioned that it's kind of like if you if you were starting out, this is kind of the ramp or the path you would take. And I, I still think it's it makes a lot of sense. I think there are, yeah, there's some things that have happened in with sweet scripts since you published it, but it's still an awesome resource. I think for anyone that's either getting started or even just, you know, if there's some aspect to sweet script development that you're not you know, intimately familiar with, it's still a great resource. And um, so thank you for writing it. It sounds like you initially wrote it for yourself, started to, you know, and. That's very much true. I'll tell you a funny story too. One of my, like, like when I wrote it, I, I, I told the team that I wrote it. I told everybody in my development team that, that you know, hey, there's this out here. And I, I gave them all a free copy. And, and you know, because a lot of times the things I learned in there, I learned from them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they had a trick or a tip that, that I, that, you know, I incorporated into my workflow and that became part of the book. So in a lot of ways that they, you know, um, they contributed to it without even knowing. So they all got a, you know, a copy of it and, and, and it became kind of a joke, an inside joke in, in, in the company. Oh, here's Matt. He wrote the book on NetSuite and yada, yada. Um, and, and then we hired a new um, development manager not, not long ago to manage the team. Um, and he's onboarding a couple of developers right now. One of them heard about, heard about the book and my manager didn't know about it. <laughs> Wow. And it was this kind of an awkward conversation. Like, hey, does anybody else know about this book? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sure they do. I, I just neglected to mention it to him. But um, but the the new um, the new uh, hires that, that just came onto the team, you know, they're 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 reading through it and they found that it's they're finding it uh, useful and they're really drinking from a fire hose anyway right now. So it's one more resource for them to step back and and and. Uh, and, and, and ramp up a little bit easier onto the, you know, get, get it to the level where they can start contributing. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I'm curious how, so both of you, we are technically, yes, we are all authors, uh, but I feel like my books are a lot shorter, right? Mine are a lot shorter, less authoritative. Sorry about that. And more, um, just, Hey, here's some quick examples of how to do a thing. I am curious how a more authoritative book, Matt, you answered a lot of this, like how it unfolds, but I'm also curious, like afterwards, 
when it was quote unquote done, how did that shift your, uh, just your work life or your, maybe your perception of work, or did you notice how it shifted others perception of you? What changed after your books were quote done? Changed. Um, well, for, I think that, the, again, I wrote this for myself. So that was, that was the, and, and the reason I wrote it for myself was to acquire mastery. But more than that, if I'm being honest, it was to, it was to assure myself of my mastery. It was to become more confident in my job and my role. And of course, that did happen. When I was able to finish that book and accomplish a goal, whenever you accomplish a goal, I feel like you've, 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 you've proved your own self-efficacy in, in such a way that you, you just become more comfortable in your role and you project that confidence. So um, certainly it was a career booster in that respect. I don't think I got a promotion you know, from junior developer to senior developer or to, to, or to solution architect or, or whatever because of the book directly although it certainly didn't hurt. Um, I, I got a lot more recruitment calls, obviously, because once you put yourself on the internet, um, you will. Um, but I think it just made me a more confident developer and it, it sort of increased my street cred uh, among like the team and of course the, the NetSuite community at large. Um, I don't know that it's that's 100% deserved either. There are lots of places at NetSuite that I have no clue about. Um, uh, but you know, setting that setting that out there and writing something that that at least pretends to be authoritative um, and comprehensive, uh, it it certainly does, you know, help your help your career and help your you know, your own um, sense of. Uh, of of how comfortable you are in in your in your job and in your field. Um, when I go to NetSuite now, I or not go to NetSuite. When I go to Sweet World, um, it's it's like I guess you can hold your head a little higher knowing that you have a name among this tiny little subculture of um, NetSuite developers. And there's a there's a small chance you'll actually be recognized. Who knows? Um, not that there's a lot of fame in 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 that, but yeah, the well, answer can be in right. that room. That's a very targeted audience, right? Yeah, in, in that room. That's it. <laughs> like beyond there, nowhere else. Yeah, nowhere else. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it it's certainly not something I regret. I don't regret the time I spent um, doing it, and, and it's it, it has been super rewarding. And in the time since, um, every time that there's a new NetSuite release or something significant changes. Um, there's this piece in the back of my head that gets this little bit of anxiety, like, oh, I gotta go update this part of the book, or this thing is no longer true that I said was true in a tooltip. Um, or, or I should add a chapter for this new plugin type that they just released, or, or um, you know, even sometimes as, as I'm working as a solution architect and I'm finding a dark corner of NetSuite that I didn't know about, that maybe has been around for a while, that's, those sort of thoughts will still intrude and I'm like, well, I kind of owe it to this unnamed student that I was writing this book to, to, to fix this so I don't lead that person astray. Does that make sense? There's yeah, almost like a definitely. relationship there with, with a generic you know, student that, that never existed or perhaps exists only in aggregate. Yeah, that's where like, especially video, anything with a user interface on a, like a software platform is so stressful <laughs> when you just try to publish something like a tutorial or a how to on anything with a user interface or anything that might undergo a significant change is very stressful. Like all my YouTube videos are probably some, somewhat out of date now with, you know, 2.1 coming out or just UI changes NetSuite has made since then. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every single release, uh, the the anxiety piles up. And, and what I've learned, and, and I'm here to tell you too, Eric, if you haven't figured this out, but people don't care, right? They they don't they they understand. They, they see the date. Hey, this was yeah. published in 2018. They they understand. Hey, that's you know that's what it that's what it was in 2018. So judge him based on that. Don't judge it based on on 2021's you know release. Um, right. So th knowing that you know it takes 
take some of the anxiety off of me. But at the same time, you know, I, I don't want my my baby to feel abandoned either. Right? I, I don't yeah. want I don't want to um just completely set it adrift. I feel responsible for, you know, for keeping it more or less, you know, accurate. And if it's it's just a matter of finding the time and the and the priority in my data to make that work. I think it says a lot about you and the quality of your work that you feel that way because it would be easy to just say you know oh well you know things change um but the fact that it kind of gnaws at you and that you know at some point you'll probably you know take the time to update it it, it just i think that's awesome and then to eric's point i i do think that I think that in the tech community now, we've all run into this enough that you you know you find a resource and you do you can tell that it's dated. Um, and it, I think the expectation is there that that could you know that that could happen that you're watching a video or you're reading something about a previous version of whether it's NetSuite or not. And, and you know you, you can, there's oftentimes where you can still get a lot of value out of that content, um, so it's not a you know a total loss. Uh, but I think it also depends on the um, you know like on the environment or the application that you've you know that you're dealing with at the time. You know, like Eric said, you know, it changes to the interface. It's you know if you're looking at an old YouTube video, there's times where it's like, oh yeah, this is really old. Um, and yet the content might still be applicable, at least hopefully to some degree. So, you know, it still gives the, the consumer of that content, hopefully some, some value. Um, so when I, when the anxiety weighs on me heavily, Tim, what I remember is that, hey, remember when I took the sweets, the sweet script uh, or the uh, sweet script test, how, how outdated that was <laughs> at the time that I took it. <laughs> I'm not sure you've taken that or the, or the sweet foundations. Uh, a lot of those, in some cases, the questions were probably, you know, the, the answers they were expecting were probably correct back then, but now they've changed, right? The, the, the correct answer is no longer the correct answer in some cases. And the, the interface or the, or the you know, the, the snippets that they're using are just so dated. So I, I don't feel as bad when the, you know, the platform's own certification program can't keep pace. Uh, how can I possibly... <laughs> How can I possibly do better than that? Yeah, we, and we've seen that in the training, you know, the official training from that suite as well. There's times where it's clearly, you know, way out of date. Um, yeah, and there are times where you question, it's almost like maybe I shouldn't watch this, you know, because <laughs> it's maybe it's actually going to do more harm than good. Um, so, yeah, it, I think that's something that's somewhat unique to, to you know, I, to IT stuff, to, especially to programming, you know, are there really that many other professions where the content changes so quickly or should change so quickly, you know, that, um, you know, that it's hard to keep up with it. So. Yeah. And it's, an, it's one thing when you're writing about your own, your, your own platform that you have control over and you know, what's on the roadmap, et cetera, but you yeah. know, really this sort of work is it's, it's dependent on NetSuite releases and, and you don't have any control over that or visibility into it for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just going to be what it's going to be and you have to react. So I've told Eric this story before and I'll keep it real short, but when I was contracted to write, I wrote a FileMaker book um, back in 2014 and I was approached by the publisher to write it. And at the time it was, the, it was version 12 of FileMaker Pro that was out. And so I started writing the book and got pretty far into it. And I won't, again, I won't go into all the gory details of it, but, you know, we got pretty deep into it. And then all of a sudden, you know, okay, Balmic Pro 13 is coming out in a couple months. And I had essentially ended up writing two books for the price of one. Um, the, the first one never saw the light of day. Uh, and it was, you know, kind of a weird experience. It was disappointing at the time. Um, it probably wasn't as much of a change between the two versions as I kind of made it out in my head to be, but it was still kind of somewhat demoralizing. But it did give me an opportunity to write the book again uh, and approach it from a different perspective. I think in the end, it, it, it turned out to be a better book as a result, but 
is it just it goes to show you that yeah it really you know depending on the platform that you're writing about it can change like so rapidly that <laughs> you can't even get the first book done and the second one's like you know okay no i need to start from scratch so luckily we haven't seen that i don't think with sweet script that would be the world would come to an end and as far as needs uh next week goes if it was that much of a sea change i think you know it'd be the equivalent of uh 2.0 going away tomorrow and instead of going to 2.1 or 2.2 like there's some completely different you know programming paradigm in the netsuite world it's apex now and everybody's netsuite instances would like it it just literally goes away overnight right and we'd all be just <laughs> it, i don't i can't even imagine what the impact of that would be but the next morning i can tell you i would be opening up a file and writing a new book because i'd have to master that <laughs> or maybe <laughs> Maybe change take, that. Uh, make another career change maybe <laughs> i don't know but yeah. yeah it's it so it is kind of weird um and eric getting back to your original question on that yeah i think writing the book for me and it's it's again it's kind of a long story it wasn't the book that i wanted to write i had always wanted to write a book but when i was approached by the publisher um you know, to write a FileMaker book, I took him up on the offer anyway, because who doesn't want to write a book? It's, you know, kind of a career changing uh, opportunity. Um, it does, you know, it gives you instant uh, I don't know, authority, I guess, um, in the space that you're writing in, you know, it, it definitely does do that, whether it's justified or not. I mean, just because you've written a book doesn't necessarily mean you're an expert in it. Um, but it definitely did boost, uh, you know, my exposure in that space, and it continues to have an impact on it. I mean, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of FileMaker work these days, um, and yet I still get approached to do it because people know that I at some point wrote a book and blah blah blah. Um, so I think it, it can have a big impact on your career, um, and a long impact i think like for matt like you know again the last time that you published that book was 2018 and you know four years later it's still having an impact i think on your career and if you never did refresh it people are gonna know like they know you like you know you're yeah. known in the community is i and i joked with eric the other day but it's not really a joke it's one of the two sweet script gods <laughs> so um you know, I think that it, it has a, it will continue to have an impact on your career, whether you realize the full impact of it or not. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. That, that's the career impact is not lost on me, but it, it wasn't a primary goal. Um, right. It, it, it's a tool. Like we've got all these Chrome plugins for NetSuite. You're, you're I'm sure you're familiar with them. You use them all every day, like every developer would, uh, like your, your sweet script, um, search exporter or your advanced um, fence field um, tool, your, your uh, field explorer. Um, these are all like made by members of the NetSuite developer community. They're, they're, and they're superstars too, as far as I'm concerned, every one of them. They've done the same thing that, that, that I've done and that Eric has done, and that's provide a tool for the people that we used to be, that you know, all the tools that we wished we had, <laughs> we're, we're trying to make it easier for the next guy. And, and that's, that's really the point as, as far as, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, um, yeah, I, th I think the authority that you get from writing the book, like, I don't think anyone sits down, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe other people do, but I like, I don't think most people who really write a book and feel passionate about the book that they're writing are doing it because they want authority. And they're certainly, hopefully not doing it, thinking that they're going to make a, a mint on it. <laughs> You know that I'll be able to retire on the the proceeds of writing this book because I can tell you this if it's a tech book it's probably not going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anything if you know, and I don't know if you've done this. I remember at the time I did, I tried to figure out like how many hours I'd put into that book, and you know you'd be better off going to get a job at like a fast food place. Like, oh, know. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so don't write a book to make money, and don't write a book to build authority. If you're lucky enough that either one of those two things happen great but hopefully you're writing the book just to get your knowledge down 
on paper, I'm putting air quotes around paper, but you know what I mean, um, just to get it out there. And I, I had the same experience that you had too in the process of writing the book. It kind of does make you, you know, it might be a platform that you've been using for years. I'd been using FileMaker for I think 12 years when I wrote that book. It's, it made me look at areas that either I wasn't as familiar with as I should be or that I had never even touched. You know, I just never needed to know about that. So it does make you a better developer, you know, I think. So on, the, on that same line, uh, I, I want to, I remember distinctly that I did not understand a map reduce script, how, how, it, how it worked beyond the, the most superficial level until I wrote that chapter. I, I had to break down a map reduce script. I had to do so many experiments in a demo account to, what would happen if I do this? What happens if I do that? To the point where I was able to just rewrite the whole MapReduce framework that's running under the under the covers in NetSuite, and 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 completely get my head around how that worked. And there's no way. I, I don't think I could have done that and got that level of understanding without having to explain it to somebody in that level of detail which is what the book gave me an opportunity to do. So I, I owe as much to that book as I ever got out of it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like it, it makes, I think in the process of trying to explain something, like in your case with MapReduce, you begin to realize that maybe you don't know it as well as you thought too, you know? And so if, if you can't explain it in words, then it makes you think about it in a different way and has the potential again, to make you a better developer as a result. So Eric, with your books, did you run into that as well? I mean, you, I know yours are very different. You mentioned like they're shorter books. They're very specialized in terms of like a specific sweet script area. Mm -hmm. But did you run into that too? And were there any that you wrote where you're like, you know, I've never done this. I've never needed this module before, but here goes. <laughs> I'm going to learn it and write about it. Did you, did you do that at all? So sort of, yes not quite at the module level. I didn't write any of, none of my cookbooks are about modules I had never used, but certainly some of them, um, I wrote the basic querying book to learn more about the new n slash query module new at the time. Um, there are the, you know, the search functionality is so extensive that in the, I wrote three, three separate cookbooks on the search module. And especially in those latter two, there were sort of uh, functions, features I had never used. Uh, so I was learning more about those, like how does when ordered by work in a script? How does it work in general? I would not understand, so similar to Matt's MapReduce story, I would not understand how when ordered by works if I had not written my transaction cookbook and, and put that example in there. Uh, nor would I have uncovered the bug that's in there and still exists today. <laughs> I think it's a bug, but, um, so yeah, I had a, a very much that experience where there were things I did not know, or s some of them were things I, uh, didn't, did not know that I did not know. And some of them were things I was aware of that, that were more like, Hey, I should learn more about this, or I'm curious about that so there was a ton that i learned when i wrote like the rendering uh the n slash render module and working with pdfs and files and sweet script i learned a lot from that book too because i had not never done a lot more than just basic uh take a template and render it into a pdf and put that in the file cabinet or render it you know display it to the user so there's a lot i learned from especially some of those later cookbooks uh so not whole modules but certainly different aspects of those modules. Interesting. So switching gears just a little bit away from the, you know, the writing, the books and stuff. Um, Matt, is, is there anything about SweetScript development that you enjoy the most? And is there anything that is that you still find so frustrating that, you know, you banging your head against your desk? <laughs> and there's a lot that I love about speed script development. I wouldn't do my job if I didn't like some parts of it. So, um, but I, I guess one of the one of the coolest things about 
sweet script development is you can make a huge impact with a, with a fairly short script. You can make um, a, you can make a lot of users very very happy with just a little bit of automation, a little bit a little bit of work. Finding that that lever that gives you so little force can move so much, you know, move the needle so much. That's that's an impactful career if you can find that. Um, and, and I and I can I can obviously um, make make someone's job possible where it wasn't possible before. I can make it easier when it wasn't easier before. And unfortunately, I have to say, I probably made people's jobs obsolete um, at some point in my life, in my, in my career, as I automate things that used to take, you know, multiple people to do, but at the same time, I'm helping the company um, to, you know, to expand without having to um, uh, take on more expenses. There's a, there's a lot of, of, of good that you can do in NetSuite development that's immediate. Um, if you're developing a, a software product that's, you know, that's uh, not on the market yet, um, you, ju you, just, you just don't know if you're ever gonna help anybody with it. Um, you immediately get to talk to your users when it's done and see how it's impacted them. Um, maintain a relationship with those people and they maintain a relationship with you and ask, you know, hey, can you make it do this now or do, do this other thing? And there's this, there's this sort of a self-affirming feedback loop that's going on there where they depend on you to do their job. Um, or, or they're or they're grateful to you for letting them do letting them do this piece of the job or doing it easier, doing it better. Um, uh, keeping them profitable, um, that kind of thing. So th these are the aspects that that I that I like about it. Um, I, I would also say that I enjoy one of my one of my sick, reprehensible pleasures is um, working on these incredibly convoluted, over customized NetSuite instances where NetSuite just doesn't bend that way. Having to architect a solution that makes it bend that way is a huge challenge for me, and that's um, I find that very gratifying. Even though, at the same time, I will do everything in my power to talk them out of going down that path. <laughs> but once they do, um, that's the kind of project I want to take on myself. I don't want to pass that off to the next developer. I want to make sure that it's if I've architected it, I want to make sure that it succeeds. Um, and and if it's super convoluted and, and can't be done, I, I want that to be on my shoulders, not on, not on some downstream developer. So um, that, that's, that's one aspect of, of, the, of the job that I like, like a lot. Um, what don't I like about SweetScript? Um, NetSuite doesn't always meet your expectations. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, examples abound. Like it should work that way, and it, it doesn't work that way. And Eric, you see, there's a there's a bug in the when ordered by functionality that NetSuite says is a enhancement request, no doubt. Um, and 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 when you run into something like that, it's it's frustrating because you have no control really over the platform itself. You're within this, you gotta stay within the bounds of what NetSuite allows you to do. And there are all kinds of creative ways to go right up to the edge of that and, and find a way to, to work around some limitation or some short, you know, shortcoming. Um, but they tend to crop up when you're almost out of budget. <laughs> oh, you've just you're just you're just about ready to finish this up, but this one last piece makes you have to rewrite this whole part of the solution because it it just you just can't search for that call. Yeah. Uh, 
or or you 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 you, you just can't get access to to the to the data that you know is on the form but is somehow not in the database not documented no no way to get at it um and i'm i'm, I'm just making up examples here uh, you know one one thing that i find frustrating is, is the the list of country codes isn't something that i can search right <laughs> um and hopefully that that'll change one day but but if you're designing something where you you want to restrict shipments to to different country codes um and you're trying to find what country code we're shipping to you can't really go anywhere in netsuite and find that unless you build the database yourself and then hope that that the politics of the globe don't <laughs> render your list obsolete <laughs> yeah. uh, there's all kinds of little frustrating things like that that i find with netsuite but all in all, um, you know, I, I love the platform, and it's it's given me a, a, a great career and a, and a chance to help a lot of people and a chance to solve problems and really have some satisfaction in a, in a, in a job that I I like to think I'm good at. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're thinking of a of a career in that suite. Think of, you know, think about those things and re realize that you're you're working inside of a moving box. That moving box is going to is going to be shuffled and jostled around at, at at the whim of of NetSuite corporate and Oracle. Um, and you you just have to do whatever good you can within it. If that sounds okay to you, then you're probably in the right in the right spot. Yeah, I think you hit on a bunch of really interesting things there. Um, the limitations of NetSuite and in particular SuiteScript, they always seem to rear their ugly head at the worst possible time. Like you mentioned, like, okay, we're real close to hitting the budget and then all of a sudden, bam, right? Okay, 20 hours to, you know, fix this, or work around this issue or whatever. So there's that. And then the, just the unexpected issues that they just the things that you take for granted like you mentioned the country codes oh, okay yeah we'll just get a list of country codes like you know in your requirements that, that may have been like okay we'll dynamically pull that and then you know you're just assuming that it's gonna be something you can do because why wouldn't it and then you know it's quite a surprise when you come across something like that and it's like oh we don't have access to that now what so you know there's there's definitely you know, that issue, I think. And then, you know, the thing I would add to what you said about being able to make, if you, if you enjoy like having an impact on people and helping them do their job, I think that's definitely, you know, a huge reason for doing the kind of work that we do. But it's also, I think, solving the kind of problems that we solve, you know, they're, we help businesses to be more efficient and that's the kind of problem I enjoy solving. You know, I'm not a guy who's ever wanted to write a video game or, you know, I'm not going to write a chat client or, you know, whatever. Like, yeah, but yeah, I love helping businesses solve problems. And that's why I think NetSuite resonates with me. It's a platform you can build on. And so, you know, it's, it is a great opportunity. And, as a, a sort of follow-up question there because you started to go down this a little bit but what advice would you give someone who is starting out with NetSuite or, or was interested in becoming a NetSuite developer you know what would you say to someone who came to you and said hey you know I'd love to be a developer it would tell me about NetSuite you know how can I get started what would your advice be well first of all I I, I probably wouldn't Take someone straight out of developer bootcamp and suggest that they go to NetSuite, to NetSuite development and look for a career in that. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage them to get some web development experience under their belt first. Um, and, and I would also encourage them to, to learn about you know, accounting. Mm -hmm. God, I can't even tell you how helpful it has been to know the basics of, of double entry accounting i don't have a degree in it I'm not I'm not in the mba or anything but 
until I took the effort to learn about accounting. My, many of the requirements I was given didn't make sense and didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, right? I was given a, a, a job to do, hey, we want, we want to, um, you know, change the way this invoice looks or change the way this, you know, this sales order represents or change the, the GL impact of this, uh, of this thing or our reporting around it or, or what have you. But without knowing something about accounting, it, it, it just didn't click, right? It didn't, I wasn't able to, to think around the problems or anticipate the problems that I would have or anticipate what wouldn't be acceptable as a solution when it was all done. Um, so knowing a little bit about accounting, knowing a little bit about, about business processes in general, knowing what, you know, what, what, a, what a purchase order is and how it relates to a vendor bill, um, no matter what system you're in, if you know that from QuickBooks or from SAP or some other you know, Sage, some other accounting platform, you're miles and, and miles ahead of where I was walking in the door, and it's going to be a whole lot less painful. Um, so definitely, it's it's not like this isn't something that if you're going to a like to 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 college to learn software development. You're, you're generally not interested in this other side of it, which is the business side. That side is the part you're trying to run away from. That was the other choice that you didn't take. I don't want to take a business degree. I want a software software degree. But the, the, the truth is, if you're coming in in NetSuite and you, have to, and you want to have um, some success in, in the field as a developer or, you know, any, and it's anything else, you kind of have to have both. You need to have that that business background, or at least the, you know, some basic knowledge about it or some interest in getting some in order to have any, any hope of being successful in a, in a career as an NetSuite developer. Yeah, I agree hundred percent with that. I, I, it gives you a, it gives you the big picture, right? As a developer, as a NetSuite developer, if you understand the business aspect of what, what's going on, you you understand more why you're being asked to do the thing you've been asked to do, the code that you've been asked to write. And I think you write better code as a result. And the other thing I would say is I think it, in some cases, you begin to have a better understanding of like what questions you should be asking about, you know, the project. Why are we doing this? Is Maybe there's a better way. <laughs> um, and, and I would also argue that like if you given the choice of hiring a developer who had like hiring someone who has a lot of development experience versus hiring someone who has a lot of business experience and a little bit of development, I'd rather pick the, the business person. Like, you know, they can pick up SweetScript, they can pick up JavaScript, you know, they can get those skills. It's like you said, the business side of it that is just invaluable and hard. It's hard to find that mix, I think, of someone who gets the business and gets the tech. Yeah. And honestly, when I'm when I'm interviewing a candidate, um, I, I I don't I don't care so much about the, the their JavaScript skills. Uh, if they got as far as in the interview process as talking to me, that they've, they've probably got the chops. I'm not I'm not there to drill them on you know the different properties of an array. Um, what, what I'm looking for is personality. I want them to be able to be flexible and, and that, you know, are they a good fit for the company? Are they going to be, I, I will happily train somebody from knowing absolutely nothing about NetSuite if, if they've got the right attitude. Um, and I think with, with NetSuite, you have to have that attitude of, okay, this is, this is the world we live in. Um, you, know, you you make the you make the best of it. Um, it's, it's not perfect, but but I but I have an interest in the business side of it. Like I I want to help my customer, and, and that's not something that's that you find in every developer. They're usually I want to write code. Yeah, they, they don't have a why. They want to write code. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something I don't think it's unique to NetSuite. Two things not unique to NetSuite. One are, is like the 
constraints of the environment. There's, you know, there's some, there seems to be this grass is always greener attitude that, uh, you know, if you weren't in NetSuite, you'd have this green field, unconstrained environment. And that's never true, no matter what area of this field you choose. There are always constraints, whether it's in the technology stack or in the sort of the business or user facing side of things, there are always constraints that you should understand and learn about. And the other one is that attitude of, of, I just want to write code or I basically I'm, I'm writing code to impress other developers. Uh, mm-hmm. and maybe impress is, yeah. is the wrong word there. And well, you should definitely write your code for the next developer uh, who's going to read it. Or maybe that's you in six months. Um, you should be, you're, no matter what field you choose, you should be thinking about a big part of why you do it should be to help the people who are going to use your software. And you should be wanting to understand their perspective, their role, their job, whatever they're trying to do, whatever their goals are, and how your software helps them get there so that you can ask better questions. If you are only there to write code, you will probably plateau very quickly and get bored, frustrated, um, burned out very quickly in that job, whatever it is. Very true. <clears throat> so before we started recording, we were chatting for a few minutes. And Matt, you mentioned that you're in the process of onboarding developers. And you said something that I think uh, piqued both Eric and my uh, curiosity. It was, that I think I wrote down, hopefully I got this exactly right, that you were thinking that uh, your developers should be starting with design instead of starting with code. I think that was the way that you you phrased that. And I'm just kind of curious about about that, about both the onboarding process right. to some right. extent. And, and it's not, not anything to do with onboarding specifically. It's just that uh, the process of 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 um, teaching the the new hires how to groom a, a development story um, was, was top of mind. And it's just super important. And it's important to me. I'm passionate about the idea that we don't start coding until we've, we've finished designing. Like we, we should, like, I, I, I guess a, a, one of the side effects of agile methodology is that you have these extremists who are like, well, just start doing something. And then we can iterate over that. And then it, it doesn't work all that well with NetSuite, to be honest with you. When you, have, um, when you have that methodology and you have that kind of an attitude, um, these are you know, production systems. These are people that are doing their jobs day to day. You can you can have an iterative idea in your head of okay here's how phase one's going to look here's how phase two is going to look, but you definitely need to know what phase one looks like before you start coding phase one. You need to think about everything from end to end and the impacts of it. Like, uh, for instance, if your if your solution is to create a custom record whenever this happens, ask yourself how many times that's going to happen. Ask yourself. How many years is going to be in place? You know, um, is this going to be this custom record going to be cluttering up a database and become a monolith um, uh, ten years from now? If 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 you're in the same situation, ask yourself: Am I going to exceed governance because somebody put it in an order that's two hundred lines long? Um, you know, if so, what's going to happen? Am I am I going to have to? Um, to, to they want this to happen in real time, but the users might not have permission to all the records that I need to make it happen. So do I have to build some sort of a backend suitelet to get the information? You have to design first before you start writing code. 
Um, and it's, it's just so easy for, especially a junior developer who's, just, who's new to the platform to, to read, you know, a set of requirements or talk to a user maybe even and, and come, come, up, come away with, okay, this is what they asked for. I'm going to give them exactly what they asked for. That never works. I don't know if you guys have, have, have encountered that before. I, I, I can say that giving the user exactly what they ask for or exactly what they, what they want, which by the way are two different things, is never as good as giving them exactly what they need, which is it's up to you to figure that out, right? They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what NetSuite can do. They've told you that at the end of the day, I want this to happen. But, but they probably also described how they want it to happen. And it's, it, you know, that's not a design. That's, that's a user request. Sometimes you can make, make it close, but do, do you understand what I'm trying to say about that? Am I being clear? Yeah, I, it's as if sometimes the customer or the user, it's like there's kind of self-prescribing, you know, a solution as opposed to just coming in and saying, I've got this problem I need help with help, you know, please solve it for me versus, okay, I've got this problem and here's how I want you to solve it. You know, because mm -hmm. it's like you said, that what they think they need in terms of like what the solution actually is or how to get to that solution might be very different from what the best solution really is. So Eric, I know you feel pretty strongly about this too. That's like, my analogy for this is like, it's you have a cough and then you went on WebMD and did a little research on your own. And you went, then you went to your doctor and said, I have cancer. I definitely, definitely have cancer. Help me. <laughs> or worse, you call in to make the appointment and it's like, okay, I'm coming in for chemo on Monday. And then they, yeah. like, why? <laughs> I have a cough <laughs> and I, you know, yeah. right. Do you, or, or, you know, you say, yeah, I have throat cancer. And then it's like, well, how do you know that? <laughs> right. So here's a, a different analogy that, that kind of puts a different spin on the problem. I think and I use this quite a, quite a lot. It's like when you're talking to a developer, a lot of times you're talking to a guy or, or a girl, doesn't matter, who has a tool belt on, right? They've got hammers, they've got drills, they've got tape measures, they've got stuff in their tool belt. And you're asking them, I need to build a, an extra bathroom. And they immediately take out a hammer and begin working. You, you can't just do that, right? You, when, when you're in that mindset, when you're a developer, you, you want to develop stuff. Designing is a completely different tool set. Like you, you, you work with pencil and paper, you imagine it out, you, 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 how much pipe do I need? Where's the water heater? Where, where's the, where's the power? You know, all these things that you're thinking about when you're, when you're a developer, you're, or more to the point, when you're, when you're requesting work to be done, be careful. You're not talking to the guy with the tool belt. Be careful not to be the guy with the tool belt. And, 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 and when you're, <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast, you're, you're probably the guy with the tool belt. And you need to you need to put that tool belt down and think about this first before you do anything. I mean, it should, it should be done in your head or on paper before you write a line of code. If you need to prototype something out in a demo account or a sandbox or something that you know that's part of the planning process, I'll go for it. I'm not saying don't mm -hmm. don't do it. Yeah, there are questions you will not be able to answer on paper. Uh, but, 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 but always start with design because it, you can do tremendous amounts of damage um, by pushing something to production without having thought it through. Right. Yeah, it can burn a lot of development cycles too, you know, developing the wrong solution. So there's that. Absolutely, which... Um, and brings up another, which is that using demos, really a lot of times what the communication breaks down right there at the beginning and, oh, that's not what I meant. 
and that's not what I asked for. And I've got him on a Zoom recording asking for that very same thing. Um, but, but, but the communication at some level is based on an assumption that just you, you two don't share for whatever reason. So a demo, uh, whenever you can squeeze one into your development cycle, um, always, always worth it. And plus it keeps the, it keeps the emotional engagement of your user. They, they're excited to see the demo. They're excited to see how it comes out. Um, they're, they're much more likely to finish their, you know, their part of the bargain. If you need information from them or data and they feel like they're a part of this process because they've signed off on a demo, um, it, it, it just makes, it makes the whole thing so much easier for everybody. You, you deliver great product. Um, the, the users are happy with, with what they deliver because it's no surprise to them. Um, uh, it, it's, it's just a great thing to, to fold into your, um, to your development cycle. Kind of went off on the rails there, went, went a little crazy. Right. Um, yeah, you, you, you threw agile under the bus a little bit and, and I totally agree with exactly. <laughs> that. And I think that another I'm going to, I can't resist another opportunity to throw something else under the bus, which drives uh, maybe code without thinking is billing by the hour where we have, we seem to not value the design as, as valuable on its own. So we don't bill for that time. You know, if you do happen to be billing by the hour, it's like the only, the only thing you can bill for is the tangible, here's the working software that you can test and play with. And I just think that's, uh, that's wrong. <laughs> I think design is very valuable. Uh, I think prototypes are very valuable. Um, and that is never wasted time, but Absolutely. too often we are, we are chasing that billable hour. So it's like, let's just get started. Let's write code so that we can charge for it. Yeah, if you're if you're finding yourself in that in that sort of a structure where you're not able to build for that design, I think you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, someone has has gone wrong somewhere, but yeah. it is not uncommon in our space. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I, I wouldn't have a job if, if my company didn't feel that design was super important. <laughs> so, but. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 it's, it's very prevalent out there, especially in the, in the contract side of things. If, if you're mm -hmm. doing billable work um, directly for a, um, for a contract uh, customer, they want, they... paying you for a deliverable. Um, and if you haven't delivered it yet, why are they paying you? Um, so I, I can definitely see how that, how that design is is less valued in that space, but we've got to all do everything in our power to kind of stick to our guns on that um, and assure these people that, yeah, you can get it cheaper, but it's, it's going to break and there's going to be things that we didn't think about if I don't take the time to chart this out. Right. As with all, all things, there is there is a balance to be struck between the planning and designing and the executing and delivering. I would say that, you know, if if I'm getting pushback on how much, you know, how much um, you know, something is gonna cost because of the design piece, and they're asking me to cut it out or to, you know, or to write it off, my desire to work with with that individual just plummets. Because I know, I know that there are going to be complaints down the road that this would have avoided. And if the conversation is this hard at the beginning, it's not going to get any easier as our It'll relationship. Not get easier. Goes. That's correct. There, there, we don't have any trust between us, and it's going to get hard to to develop that if we just don't. If we're not seeing eye to eye there, and I know that's a big thing with you too, Eric, which is why you you. 
one of the big things about your your push for um, for for moving away from the billable hour is is because of that, right? That trust. Yes, I think. I mean, there's a lot to it, and I will avoid the soapbox, but that is definitely a part of it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a, a a dog in that race, I guess. But um, right, I, I definitely see, you know, the the fixed fee being super, you know, super valuable. When there are a lot of unknowns, possible, I promise. When there are a lot of unknowns, I have a hard time embracing it. Mm -hmm. When there, when there are, when things are much more, you know, much more ner uh, known and less nebulous, um, and then sure, yeah, put a price tag on it and stick with the price line, price tag, and everybody's happier. It just, it just gets the job done. bureaucracy but if there are a lot of unknowns and both sides know that i just i just feel there's a lot of a lot more comfort in the, in the billable hour on both sides uh, we're not we're not going to argue about that I, probably not an hour and 15 minutes into the episode but <laughs> oh fair enough i mean if you've ever paid someone by the hour yourself, like there's so much, depending on what it is, if it, if it lasts any length of time, like a, like a software project does, there's so much anxiety about like, especially if you're not like sitting in the same room as them, which is never the case in our world. There's so much anxiety about like, well, is, is the meter running right now? How much am I going to, you know, what's going to show up on my bill? And like, as the projects go on and on and on, that anxiety only builds. And at the same time, usually as you get closer and closer to some deadline, the dev team is working more and more. They're working longer hours. They're throwing more people on the project if it's getting behind. So those bills, while the meter is running, get higher and higher and higher. And that anxiety gets worse and worse and worse. And everybody's incentives are misaligned. Well, absolutely. No, you're you're out you're 100 percent right. And that brings us right back to um Mm -hmm. Design first. Design first. Get rid of those. Get rid of those uncertainties, and then you're in a position to to do a fixed fee. You, then you can be confident in your in your estimate and know that you're going to be able to keep your promise. Because it it really is. You're given an estimate at the beginning, no matter what you're doing. You're giving an estimate, and if you don't keep that estimate, stay under it, or stay near it. You've you've really kind of broken a you know broken a promise and broken trust. Um, starting from design helps you keep that trust. I think that's a good place to put a bow on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could definitely go down deeper down the that rabbit hole of yeah. hourly billing or value. It's billing. clear Matt needs to come back and talk to us again. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, happy to take your call whenever whenever you guys reach out. I owe uh, I owe Eric quite a bit um, for my whole career. Probably he's the guy who taught me Sweet Script to begin with. So there would be no me without him. Um, so anytime, anytime you guys need somebody to fill an hour. Well, that's right. awesome. Well, pick you up on that at some point for sure. Yeah, definitely. So. If Matt, if people want to get in touch or find out more about you or your book or 360, where should they go? Oh, uh, where should they go? Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say don't go to my LinkedIn and send me a message because I will absolutely ignore it. <laughs> uh, we will that, not put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I mean, always... Um, Happy to, to take a question about the book through the Lean Pub site, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, a link to the in the show notes. I'm sure for that. Um, yep, absolutely. I would say, you know, reach out through Species of Cloud Solutions if you need to talk to me, or you know, send a message to Eric and let him convey it on. I'll listen to him. <laughs>
You can also find me in NetSuite Professionals uh, Slack if you're in there. I'm not as active as I used to be, but um, still kind of monitor. So whenever something happens, tag me there. I might uh, might just be available and talk to you right then. All right. And one thing we like to do to wrap up every episode is just talk about something interesting, fun, cool we've we've found recently. Um, can be work related, can be not work related, and Tim gets to go first because I said so. Because <laughs> I always make you go first. Uh, so my thing this week isn't really new, but and I've actually had this book for a few years, um, and it's been around for a while. It's a book called The Grammar Devotional uh, by I'm going to totally butcher her first name, but it's Mignon Fogarty, who's better known as Grammar Girl online. <laughs> And uh, this is a, a tiny little book. It's probably one of a handful of physical books that I still own. That's a long story. But um, it's basically a book of 365 uh, tips uh, for improving your grammar. And I, I just, I find it fascinating. There's things in there that I just did not know. Uh, and so it's kind of fun to pick it up and flip through it. It's also fun to try, you know, every day to look and see what the tip of the day is, that sort of thing. So anyway, that's my admittedly different cool thing this week. All right, Matt, do you have something or should I go? Do we have a cool thing? Um, I'm, I'm scrambling for a cool thing. Right. Well, um, I'll go. I'll buy you some time. All right. Th thank you, Eric. Mine, mine is also a book. I had a, a birthday recently uh, in the time that we're recording this right now, and I got a whole bunch of books for gifts. And the first one I'm starting with is called uh, The Art of Gathering, and it's by Priya Parker. It is an excellent book about uh, just having better, better gatherings, <laughs> excuse me, whether that is your family holidays, your business meetings, just any gatherings of more than two people, um, leading those, organizing those with more intention, purpose behind them, and leaving them with more meaning and transformation. So highly recommend it. I haven't finished it yet, but it's even the first... Uh, She's a great storyteller, and even the first two chapters have just been uh, very exciting for what might sound like a very dry topic. Interesting. And that if you don't have a cool thing, I have one for you. <laughs> uh, so if that'll help, I'll... I'll, I'll so I, I actually do have a cool thing. It's completely unrelated to anything, but it sounds like that's the theme we're going in. Yep. <laughs> it's not necessarily related. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier by taking the NetSuite like requirement off of the cool thing. <laughs> yeah, cool and NetSuite don't go together in a lot of circles. The Venn diagram does not cover a lot of space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I'm taking on personally is um, I'm trying to learn Mandarin Chinese. And I have come across a really cool podcast by a couple of guys um, who, you know, learned it, taught it, still teach it as, as kind of a, a business. Um, I think it's called Learning Mandarin Chinese Podcast. I'm trying to find um, what their names are right now so I can pass that along to you. Look it up on my phone. But it's just an amazing, and it doesn't have anything to do with the actual language itself, but just Chinese culture and um, the struggles of, a student as they're trying to learn Chinese, not necessarily the content, but uh, methods and, and, and the unique things about the language that make it hard, like the idea that the alphabet is impossible to read until you can already read it. <laughs> Interesting. Is there a reason that you are trying to learn the language or is it just on a whim, you're just doing it? Uh, <laughs> so it's it started off, um, as a more or less a whim. I was like, I, I need something to do that was difficult. 
I think you should always be doing something difficult. That's one of my personal philosophies that just has nothing to do with anything. Um, but I, I always think you should be doing something that's a stretch for you. It's difficult. And um, it was suggested at, at some point in my head that, that Mandarin Chinese would be a great thing to do. So I started um, down that path. And that led to, okay, well, if I'm going to learn this, I'm going to put a date in the calendar where I'm going to China and, and book a trip. And I'll have until then to become, you know, as fluent as possible. So it started off being a whim, but now I'm doing it because of that. So how about that? <laughs> nice. um, Constraints China, are great motivators. They, they absolutely are. If you don't give yourself a deadline for something, uh, you are never going to do it. Yeah, that's and I'm trying to find the podcast here. I guess we'll, we'll put the podcast in the, in the show's link. Yep. Can I send it to you after I find it? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So the cool thing that I was going to throw out for you, if you didn't have one, is actually yet another link. Um, Matt has uh, very uh, graciously provided a link for a discount on, the, on his book. And we'll include that in the show notes. Um, it's a pretty huge discount, and it's good through April 4th. So uh, we'll drop that in the show notes as well. And Matt, thank you so much for that and for agreeing to, to come on our podcast today. It was really awesome getting a chance to talk to you and hear your story. And for me, it's kind of interesting to you know, hear what it's like to work with Eric and how you guys get to know each other. That, that was really nice. So thanks for doing all that. And thank you guys for having me. All right. That'll do it for this week. Join us next time for more Sweet Script Stories. Bye-bye.